For the last 10 years or so, there's been a lot of talk in the news and online about shipwrecks that are illegally salvaged. A lot of these ships the salvagers target are warships, and one of the reasons people like to use to explain why is because these ships are made of low background steel. That is, steel made before the first nuclear weapons. Steel isn't very radioactive, but ever since 1945, a small amount of radioactive particles from the nuclear weapons tests has contaminated newly smelted steel. Most of the time, that contamination doesn't matter, but there are a few instances where it does, usually in particle physics or some types of radiation detectors. With all the talk about low background steel going around, there seem to be a few misunderstandings or misconceptions that get repeated over and over again. So in this video, I'm going to try to clear up some of the more common misconceptions I've seen floating around, starting with low background steel needs to come from shipwrecks. Water can protect things from some types of radiation, but in this case it's irrelevant. Steel is usually contaminated during the original smelting process. I am maybe not the most qualified to talk about this, but from everything I've seen, it was common to pump air through the molten metal, and the point in doing that was to get the oxygen to combine with other atoms, which helps remove impurities. It would also combine with carbon in order to make low carbon steel. However, the air also contained the higher than average radiation, which contaminated the steel. Today, it's more common to use pure oxygen instead of the atmospheric air, but even that is rarely 100% pure, and the steel can still become contaminated. Contamination can also happen while the steel is being recycled. If you mix already contaminated steel with the uncontaminated steel, it'll contaminate the whole bunch. But also, when foundries make steel, they'll sometimes include scrap metal along with the iron ore or pig iron. Steel does not become contaminated from simply being exposed to air. Any steel from before the first atomic bombs is low background steel, and there are quite a few examples of people using low background steel that did not come from shipwrecks. The one that I'm going to use is from Fermilab in Illinois. They acquired armor from decommissioned American warships and used it for things like shielding for their sensors and filters in their particle accelerators. Their armor came from cruisers like Baltimore and Worcester, and from Essex-class carriers like Bunker Hill and Antietam. The next misconception is that the German fleet in Scapa Flow is an excellent source of low background steel. There is a kernel of truth in this, because the ships were absolutely salvaged in the past, and there are very famous pictures of the ships either under tow or being scrapped. Plus, we know at least some of it was used for its pre-atomic properties, but there are a few things that are very easy to overlook. The first is that by 1939, the Royal Navy and various other British companies recovered all but ten of the warships. Nine were underwater, and those are the ones that are still there today. Then Derflinger was afloat, but it couldn't leave Scapa Flow because of the start of the war. She would eventually head to the breakers once the war ended. So by the time it became an issue, the majority of the ships were already gone. Then, when salvaging continued, they stopped trying to raise the ships as a whole and went for a more targeted approach. They went after non-ferrous metals, mostly copper and copper alloys, in the form of pipes, the machinery, torpedo tubes, propellers, and so on. The four cruisers and three battleships have very obvious openings into their machinery spaces, specifically into the turbine rooms where the condensers are. S-54 is also missing its condensers, while V-83 is missing both the condensers and the turbines. Meanwhile, the salvagers spent decades recovering the battleship's thick armor plates alongside the non-ferrous metal. In 1971, a company named Scapa Flow Salvage bought the rights to salvage the ships, and they found that almost all of the easy-to-access armor on Koenig and Kronprinz Wilhelm was already gone. Mark Graf was more intact, so the company focused on her more than the other two. 
The steel was sold as regular scrap and went to steel mills in Germany and sometimes Sheffield. However, a small portion of the steel went to a specialist company in Edinburgh who used it for its low background properties. By the late 1970s, scrap metal prices were declining, so they sold off their salvage rights. They ended up being the last company that did any significant metal recovery. It's been more than 45 years since there's been any real, large-scale salvage operations on the wrecks. To cap things off, in the early 2000s, they became scheduled monuments, which protects them from further salvage. Even if somebody recovered smaller bits of metal in the 80s and 90s, that had to stop in the 2000s. So, the wrecks were a source of low background steel in the past, but they've been protected sites for more than 20 years now. Plus, the steel wasn't the only thing recovered, and only a little bit of steel went for low background use. The other misconception I'll talk about here is kind of similar, because it states that the warships in Southeast Asia are being salvaged for low background steel. This is a little tricky to talk about, since there's a lot of speculation here that people are taking as fact. As far as I can tell, nobody has interviewed or interrogated the people on the barges that are recovering the metal, or anyone from the companies involved. None of them explicitly said that they're doing this for low background steel, for regular scrap, or for any other reason. An investigative journalist in Indonesia did speak with scrapyard workers, but his investigation was focused on rumors of human remains more than where the steel is going. But we do know what they've done because there have been quite a few surveys around Indonesia and Malaysia. Some ships, like the British cruiser Exeter, the Dutch cruiser Java, the American submarine Perch, and a few others, are already gone. Then other ships, like the Australian cruiser Perth, the two Force Z ships, and the Dutch destroyer Cortenaire were heavily damaged. But it's worth mentioning that a lot of the reports I found are old, so some of these wrecks are probably even more damaged, if they're still there at all. It's clear in all of these cases that steel is not the only thing the salvagers are recovering. The Force Z shipwrecks, Prince of Wales and Repulse, are nearly hollowed out. The salvagers nearly cleared out the machinery spaces, and the survey found cordite pellets that suggest they took the brass powder casings for the secondary guns. The report doesn't mention armor, but it's clear that some of the hull on Repulse is missing all the way down to the seafloor. In Prince of Wales' case, it looks like she still has her transverse bulkhead, but she's also missing large portions of her hull. On lesser salvaged ships, the main damage is from openings into the hull in order to remove material from the interior. This is especially true on the American cruiser Houston. Salvagers removed metal plates to get inside the ship, and there's even a water dredge lying on the hull next to one of those openings. For the Dutch ship Cortenaire, the ship sank in two pieces, so the machinery spaces are already exposed. Salvagers still removed some of the plating on the stern so that they can take the compressors and other equipment in the area. Of course, for the ships that are completely gone, they took everything, steel and all. With that said, I'm going to end this video with a quick reminder. Warships are very interesting machines with very interesting histories, and that draws a lot of attention to them. However, warships are not the only shipwrecks that are illegally salvaged. The Filipino ferry Doña Marilyn sank in a typhoon in 1988. This was a passenger ferry that traveled between Manila and Tacloban. It may have taken the lives of as many as 400 people when it sank, and sometime around 2018, the wreck was illegally salvaged and partially collapsed from the activity. A few accusations are flying around over who did it, but again, it's all speculation. For what it's worth, Doña Mary Lynn was built in the 1960s, and should have had little to no low background steel on board, yet it was still a target for the salvagers. There is a lot more that can be said about illegally salvaging shipwrecks. This only really scratches the surface. So, if you'd like to see more videos on this topic, please let me know in the comments below, and please subscribe to stay tuned for more.